And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer here in the temple. One part, one part of Black, one part of Black Oath, the cr developers of the upcoming adventure Across the Thousand Dead Worlds, which we'll be getting into today. The man best known as Alex. How are you doing today, man? Or tonight, in your case? Yeah. <laughs> Hi. You know, it's it's great to be here. I'm very happy for for this opportunity. It's going to be fun. Mm -hmm. So. I'd like to open up with the humble beginnings, in a sense. Sure. Walk, so, me, through your but, first, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, and what was it that made it stick? Yeah, so... I don't know. It, <clears throat> my actual first introduction would have been... Uh, the red Dungeon, Dungeon Dragons box, you know, the, the classical red box, but I, I was like... I don't know, it must have been like 10... So I wasn't really aware uh, I was playing a role-playing game. I mean, it was just a game. My, some One of my cousins had it, and he just suggested we'll try it out. I don't even remember how we played it, if we played it correctly. I I really don't remember anything at all. Mm -hmm. And then fast forward a couple of years, and yeah, it was like in 1992. That is when I actually started playing role-playing games like in a conscious <laughs> way with uh, with Merp, with Miller, Miller Earth role-playing. Mm -hmm. And that was, yeah, that got me hooked in instantly. And then from there, it was all just, I don't know, a lot of role master, a bit of uh, Advanced Dungeons & Dragons, of course, uh, Call of Cthulhu, I don't know, all the classics, Vampire, all the early, mid-90s classics. And with that, now within, the, I was going to ask if you were, if you were a one, if you were a one system lifer, but since you dipped around with, um, red, with Redbox and then Roll and then Rollmaster, yeah. um, get, I think that question's very much been answered. Um, <laughs> no, no, I'm. Not, if I had to choose one system, I think it would be probably Rollmaster because it's my my long law. Um, love affair <laughs> with you, it. I if you don't yeah mind yeah if asking, I had if you don't sorry mind, sorry go ahead if you don't mind me asking did you ever dip into Space Master? No, I didn't even knew it existed back in the day. So I no, I I never never played. I I I got the book from Drive Through RPG like a year ago to just look over it and yeah it looks this is from master in space so it looks fine but i never actually played it i i don't know i'm i never was really into that kind of open setting for for space so they now that i think of it i think the only science fiction role-playing game i ever played was uh the original um, star wars and well if you want to you want to consider Shadow Run and Cyberpunk science fiction, which I think I guess they are. Yeah, but I mean, like space stuff. Yeah, I think it was only Star Wars. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> yeah. Now, with that in with that in with that in mind, as I understand it, Across a Thousand Dead Worlds is. Lean, is leaning more t is leaning more towards the hard end of sci-fi with a little with possibly a little bit of influence of Alien. Yeah, <clears throat> definitely. It's the setting is uh, more or less a hundred years from now, so you can expect the logical evolution of technology that, that one would expect in in a hundred years. So there's nothing outlandish there's no interstellar faster than light travel there's nothing like that so yeah in that sense what is the human level of technology is just us right now in a hundred years so yeah you have some level of implants you have some since you're working with a corporation you have access to experimental weaponry and a couple of more outlandish things but this 
it's all pretty grounded. Mm -hmm. Now, with the, with that with that in mind, one of the one of the other things that you that you um put front and center on the Kickstarter page is GM being optional, which is certainly something that I've been I've been seeing a, f a fair amount in in the in the last few years. Um, when how do you how do you plan to accommodate um, running that running something like this completely GMless? I'm always cu I'm always curious as to the how. Yeah, <clears throat> so the thing uh, I've been always since I started with Black Oath, I've been always focusing on solo RPG experiences because well, initially it was because I simply didn't have anyone <laughs> to play with my regular group wasn't really doing anything um, and I just wanted to, to create worlds where I could play alone. So the options out there are quite slim right now. There are a couple of big names like, uh, well, mostly Iron Sworn and, and now their, their sci-fi spin-off, the uh, Iron Sworn Starforge. But that's that's mostly it. I mean, you have well, Scarlet Heroes has solo, pretty decent solo rules uh, out of the box, but this, this there's just nothing. I mean, actual actual RPGs like the traditional feeling of playing with a with a group and a GM. There's there's just nothing. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> so yeah, the the idea was to create a good sci-fi game. Uh, with a big focus on solo, but also with the option of playing it co-op without a GM, or even with a GM if you want to, if you want to play the most traditional way, which is actually super easy because the way solo solo RPG, I mean playing an, an RPG solo, it's basically through the use of a, a lot of oracle tables and a lot of random tables. So you will basically outsource all the questions you will traditionally ask uh, or the feedback you will get from a GM you you outsource it to the to the oracle tables so I don't know if you're familiar with mythic I the, am the yeah well for for those who don't know mythic is the I don't want to say the first but it's definitely the the one the first solo system that really made an impact in <laughs> into the RPG scene and and the granddaddy of all the modern systems, I'd say. So, if you if you are remotely interested in in playing any RPG alone, you just I recommend you just grab a copy of Mythic, mm -hmm. and 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 there you go. So, the way it works is very similar. I mean, in in a thousand dead worlds, very similar to Mythic. You you have your your main oracle, which is basically just table of uh, percentages with the different answers to, uh, um, to let's see how, how I explain this <laughs> without sounding too complicated. Uh, essentially, you would uh, you will assign a, a percentage or a probability to the to to the answer to a positive answer to to the question you ask. So, for example, if you are climbing a hill and you suspect maybe there's some rocks falling your way that something like that can happen so you, you you just go to the table and say okay i think it's quite probable that this will happen so probable has a certain percentage you just roll with the with the dice on the table and, and if the result it's the the probable percentage then yes maybe it actually happens so from that basic table you work with a, a lot of other another series of tables which go into more detail like for example when you're dealing with npcs the kind of reaction they'll have to to certain uh, actions or their initial reaction when you encounter them their interests motivations i mean anything that you will usually ask uh, a gm you're going to find a table for it mm -hmm. so that's it it's a lot of a lot of page flipping, that's for sure. A lot of <laughs> consulting tables, 
but uh, it's it's on it's the only way of doing it in a coherent and cohesive way because otherwise it becomes just an exercise of of creative writing if you if, if you don't outsource those kind of questions and you just answer them yourself i mean which is certainly a possibility you end up just playing with yourself without so many surprises the the cool the the cool thing about Playing with the with all these random tables is they are con you're constantly surprised and you really don't know where the story is going to go, so that's what makes a role playing game interesting. Uh, aside from the social aspect, which of course when you're playing alone doesn't exist, so you're left with the character progression and the story taking turns that you you don't expect, which is very important to preserve in in a solo experience, I think, and and it. it it definitely happens when you're playing across a thousand dead worlds. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> give, given that, given that, with these, as I understand it, the setup, the setup with the with a thout, with a cross, which is what I'm going to call the full the full thing, because unfortunately, I'm not <laughs> paid by the syllable. Um. Is the, is the idea that you that you've that you've um, taken up a job on the Har on um, Harum Station Enterprises and are going to be doing a whole lot of space exploration and all the all the da all the dangers that come that come from it, which is where I was getting the um, flashbacks to Alien. Yeah. Um, and with. But one of the things that I could that I couldn't help but notice is the fact that you're use that even that you're using a what I what I suppose I could call a pure d twenty um approach. What with with the fact that all, all that all that matters yeah. is that if the total is if the total is over twenty. Yeah, yeah, that's the that's the core mechanic. Mm -hmm. Um, you just. Roll your d20 and you add your attribute or your skill, depending on on what check you're you're testing against. Mm -hmm. And and if it's 20 or more, that's it. You it's a success. Of course, you have difficulty modifiers and things like that. But yeah, that's the core mechanic for the whole game. Yeah. Now, one of the other one of the other things that was brought that was brought up when I went through the preview document and through the Kickstarter page was introducing a bit of a tactical nature to it how do you go how do you go about that especially in a game that is gm optional yeah so originally my design for the game i mean yeah i always wanted it to be tactical but it was more of a of an optional actually the first play tests the tactical Tactical combat rules weren't were were that. I mean, were they were just optional. We had the traditional theater of the mind uh, way of dealing with combat, but due to the nature of the combat rules, which is which they are strongly influenced by by skirmish games. I I must admit, it's for example Necromun Necromunda. It's it was a big influence in the in the combat. So logically. Uh, you end up with the almost necessity of having to to use some kind of battle map in minis or to tokens or something like that. And I just realized that it was pointless to <laughs> to try to force the rules into something they weren't and decide to make the official way to, to play the game just tactical. So it's pretty pretty simple. I mean, as you just set up the the, the uh, there's a blank battle map that comes with the with the book. It's just a uh, hexagons, a typical hex, hex grid for combat, mm -hmm. uh, and a bit in the in the style of GURPS. It's just a larger larger hexes because I wanted the action to be really immediate. I don't want I I hate when you're playing some kind of skirmish game. And you spend the first six, seven turns just moving forwards. <laughs> so this is in one, two turns you are there. On top of that, most of the weapons, uh, range weapons, reach the other side of the of the map. So I mean, the action is immediate; it happens right away. Mm -hmm. 
and you just print out the battle map or well or since we just unlocked the <laughs> i just saw we unlocked the latest stretch goal which means everybody who backed the the game is getting a, a few battle maps designed by glim seal mm-hmm. so yeah that's great instead of simply printing the, the blank one out you you can use these ones that that are going to be included which have already terrain and cover and everything. Otherwise, if you use the blank one, there's tables to randomize things like cover and, and things like that. So the also the deployment of uh, both sides. So as the whole game is is randomly generated, and that includes the combat and the combat setup and everything. Mm-hmm. Now, with that with that kind of thing in mind. Because of the fact that we're that you're dealing, this is a game dealing with the horrors of space. How do you how do you reinforce that when it comes to when it comes to enca- when it comes to encounters and just general survival out out on unno- out on the unknown frontier? Yeah. So the first thing is that there's a strong element of uh, uh, stress, but not only because of the environment, but because of even your own. Uh, crewmates you can there there can be a bit of a spiral down spiral when for example one of the characters by the way this happens also if you're playing solo because mm-hmm. I, although you can play purely solo just with your own character and that's it and i i would recommend for the fun and full experience you get a, at least a couple of npcs there are simplified rules for for controlling the NPCs they are not full blown characters, although you can just make three characters and, and play them equally. But if you just want to focus on your own character, you have your own full developed character and then the simplified NPCs. Mm. So the thing is that you can eat each other you can get on each other's nerves basically. <laughs> Especially when you're aboard a ship that uh, I don't know if you you read the whole premise of the of the game, but there's your boarding ships that you have no control where they're going. You, you can't pilot them at all. You just board, click start, <laughs> and 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 that's it. And the ship, it's it's randomly where it arrives. You don't know how long it's going to take to uh, to get there. You don't even know if you are actually going to get there. There's slim chance, but real chance that you arrive and you die because you arrive to. Uh, where uh, sun has gone supernova and you just die <laughs> so I mean it's not it hasn't happened yet but it can happen so all those kind of things you have to take them into consideration which means that it, since you don't know how long the, the trip is going to take you have to plan your rations and oxygen and, and everything in advance taking into consideration the fact that you don't know how long it's going to take to get to your destination and also, not only that, the fact that once you're there, you must have enough resources to come back, to, to make it back to Karim Station. So all that uh, puts a lot of uh, psychological pressure on the characters, mm-hmm. which means they their stress starts going up, which means infighting can take place. And you end up with uh, obsessions. You can end up, if things get really ugly, you can end up with trauma. When you see other characters getting into a bad place psychologically, it also affects you, of course. The fact that, for example, you need to ration your your supplies because you think you're not going going to make it also can put a lot of pressure on the character. So there's a series of things that slowly eat away at your your sanity or or at least uh, mental stability. And and when things get really ugly, you end up with trauma, which is permanent. You end up with negative modifiers, and the only way of dealing with that is back at at station, um, paying for a psychiatrist. So yeah, you can remove it, but it's it's not cheap, not easy. It takes time. So yes, <laughs> that's that's why it, uh, the current station authority issues with. With each mission, uh, a bunch of drugs for you to <laughs> to calm down. So yeah, stress is a is an important thing to manage and, and a big risk for your for the success of each mission. Mm-hmm. 
Now, with that with that in mind, you also br bring up on the page that it is a sci-fi toolbox, i.e., this could, I, you could use that you could use this to at, to generate plant to generate planets or sta or stations for other role-playing games. Um, I'd like you to go into a bit of the toolbox aspect and how that how that's going to potentially work. I mean, obviously tables are involved, but that but um that doesn't exactly narrow things down by much. Yeah, <clears throat> the thing is that as I mentioned, everything in the game is randomly generated. And most of it is, uh, to a certain degree, is systemless, uh, system neutral. Mm -hmm. So, for example, the whole chapter which deals with um, game master emulation and, and NPC emulation, all the behavior of NPCs, all that kind of stuff is completely system neutral. So you can just take that whole chapter and use it to um, to solo any other sci-fi game. It's, is uh, focus on sci-fi elements, of course. So you, I mean, I guess you could use it to run some fantasy game, but it's it's done for sci-fi. So you want to run Alien alone or Mothership alone, whatever? You can just take that chapter and the full chapter, and, and there you go. All the tools you need to play any sci-fi RPG alone. Aside from that whole chapter, you have a lot of other sections, which for which you mentioned already. For example, the, the alien facility generation, um, all the, all the details, how large it is, what was its original function, a kind of uh, I mean the overall look of it, the dangers, all that sort of stuff. You can. You can apply to any to any other game, and the same goes with the for the um, the random planet generator, which is a typical that's strongly influenced by Traveler. So you have your weather systems, um, I don't know <laughs> all the details you need for to in order to explore a, a planet, which is by the way done. It's a it's a hex crawl. So the way you explore planets is hex by hex. And each time you reach a new hex, you roll on the tables and see what's what's there. It depends on the biome. Of course, it can be a and it can be the, the whole planet can be a single biome, like typical tattooing style of planet. Or you can land in one specific biome. You can maybe land inside a ocean. So you have all the water-based exploration, but then you exit that biome and then you check. Uh, what the next uh, biome is so yeah you you can be generating biome by biome each each planet mm -hmm. and and last but not least is the fact that even enemies and creatures are randomly generated which of course includes the the stat blocks which are obviously <laughs> would only work for across a thousand dead worlds but the things like the role or the demeanor, the general behavior, their of course the the appearance, all those things are system neutral, and you could also use that system to generate any kind of abomination for for any other game. So yeah, there's a lot of aspects. I would say at least fifty percent of the of the book is random stuff which you can apply to any other to any other sci-fi game. Mm -hmm. Now. When it now, when it comes to how the game plays, you mentioned a stamina me mechanic allowing allowing you to determine to determine your choice of maneuvers. Would stamina yeah. in that regard be akin to an action point system or something else? Uh, yeah, it's definitely an, an action point system. So it's you have uh, <clears throat> by well, you start with ten stamina per per round. You can get more with certain talents and gear, even some drugs, things like that, you can boost your stamina. But the average is 10 points of stamina, which you decide how to spend. So aside from the, that, that doesn't include mo movement, by the way. You you can move once per turn, mm -hmm. and and then you have your 10 points of stamina, which you can use both for offensive maneuvers or defensive. And so you can, for example, do some a standard attack cost 5 stamina. So you that's your standard attack. Then you have another five points, which you can choose to 
use it defensively if you are against a few enemies or you can perform a, a second attack or if your weapon allows it you can perform a quick attack which just costs three stamina so i mean you have a lot of options and then when you enter when you have the fact that you also have active talents which grant you uh, unique abilities which costs they each one of them have a different cost in, in stamina so your your repertoire really opens up and, and you end up with a lot of different combinations and, and decisions, which in my opinion makes combat a bit more interesting, especially when when you're playing solo, because one of the problems I, I noticed from my previous games is that they were my other games, uh, it's traditional traditional way of dealing with combat, like it would be in Dungeons and Dragons, whatever, you roll, then the opponent rolls to see if they avoid it, or I mean... It was it was all player fronted, so you had to roll to see if you hit, and you had to roll to see if the opponent hit you. But I mean, it was basically that it was just roll, 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 roll. Here, when your turn comes, you have to think, see what your options are, see why, what the board looks like, see what's the nearest nearest threat, how to handle it, how many points of stamina you should be saving for defensive maneuvers. So I mean, it's it's much more tactical, much more involved and much more fun when you're playing alone to make that kind of decisions otherwise it's just rolling 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 and it gets tedious mm -hmm. that and that and putting perhaps too much faith in the in the dice gods which yeah. as you, you know as well as i do that is <clears throat> not the be, not yeah. the best idea yeah it's a, it can be a mistake <laughs> so I'd like to talk a bit about advancement. Sure. From from everything that I saw, it doesn't look like you're using a level based approach with advan with advancement. Um, so is, is it a case of ex of experience as currency, a la World of Darkness? Mm, yes, uh, but I wasn't. Uh, last time I played any World of Darkness game was literally in the nineties, so I well, don't remember. I don't remember a, how experience. Using that as an example. <laughs> As an example, just the idea of gaining XP and then and then spending it directly instead of it being oh sorry no 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 level. no so whether it be no 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 it's it's not that system at all it's no when you mentioned currency I thought you meant the old school way of doing it in Dungeons and Dragons which means gold is experience no which is the no it is the case here actually the the Whatever, because your goal is to go out, explore the different planets, facilities, and whatever you you find. Mm -hmm. But the actual goal is to recover artifacts and and precious materials to bring back to to current station. So the more you bring, the more it translates into into credits. Well, in this kind, in this case, it's called a Drake coin, which is the cryptocurrency of of the station. So. If you bring, uh, let's say, 600, um, a, a, a lot worth 600 Drake coins, you get half of that in, in experience points. In each level, uh, to level up to the next level, it, you require, you need, it's always uh, the same amount, it's always 1,000 a a thousand experience points. Mm -hmm. So basically, each 2,000 gold, whatever you want to call it, Drake coins, you make you you level up, mm -hmm. and and with each level, you get uh, points to distribute on, among your attributes, skills, and and roll in on on the talent table, which is there are three separate tables, and and it's random. You just get a different talent. There are a maximum of five talents you can have at equipped at once. So ideally, you will be rotating them and seeing what what interests you. And aside from that typical way of dealing with character progression, the other side would be gear. Gear is a very big deal. Mm -hmm. How you it's limited. I mean, you have the basic gear which everybody can access, and then you have the more rare and an experimental gear which costs a lot of money. Then you have, of course, implants, which really boost your capabilities. So all that kind of stuff, it's a, it's a big secondary path of character progression. Mm -hmm. 
Now, with that, with that in mind, with that kind of thing in mind, um, I'm cur One thing I'm cur one thing I'm curious on is given all given all of the tables. Do you guys have plans to, um, put s to put some of to, um, put some of the tables on, on say on say an auto generator on s on a web on a website of yours or something like that down the road? Well, that will be very very cool but <laughs> right now i don't know if i have the resources for it honestly um i will need to i'll, I'll love to do it of course but it's not i can't say it's in the in the works because it's just a bit beyond the my cap my current capability cap capability so yeah unfortunately not yet but i hope we can get there at some point because it will be it will definitely speed things up for a for a player to be able to randomly generate whole alien site with a click. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that will be very very cool. I don't know. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully we can make it happen. Yeah. Uh, now I I know I know that you're planning on being f fairly fairly system neutral, but are but are you going to be dedicating a chapter just to just to explore just to exploring each section within car within say Karum station um yes it's a whole chapter i mean the the focus of the game right now is definitely on uh, on the planet planet and an alien site exploration but there is a whole chapter dedicated to Karum station describing the different the different activities there. Actually, the first one of these, one of the stretch goals we unlocked, the one from yesterday, was it? Or yeah, mm, it's going to be a whole scenario that takes place in Karm Station. So yeah, there's certainly things you can you can do there, and I intend to expand that in in the future. Mm -hmm. Right now, the as I said, the focus is. Some planetary and, and alien site exploration, but there's certain things you can do at current station, and, and of course, aside from the typical carousing tables mm -hmm. and dealing with the many tourists the station has, mm -hmm. you can visit the museum you have there. You have um, different activities like uh, training to increase your capabilities and recovering from. Permanent injuries, recovering from trauma. You have all those, all that kind of um, downtime stuff. You can, you all that takes place in current station. So yeah, I try to flesh out that in in, in its own chapter. Mm -hmm. And with the with that kind with that kind of thing in mind, I'm I I'm curious if the if um. If some if some aspects of the solo thing, especially if you plan on putting a solo adventure in the book, if that's going to be taking cues from, say, game books. The thing is, um, I try to avoid that because it's really not necessary to to go that way when when you have all the tools. To literally emulate what a game master would do, you just don't need to go that close, narrow path. So it, it's just like playing any other adventure. You have your options, and you you go through it the way you will with a game master. It's just you follow the story yourself. You you use the different random tables to see how the how things evolve and change, but that's it. I mean, you don't need to go down the path of a of a game book. Mm -hmm. So I I don't think. I mean, I need to talk with Leo, which is the one writing this first adventure. But I, for what I know, he's definitely not going to to do anything like that. It's much more open. You'll have your your different options. The, the same kind of options you'll have if you're playing with a game master, especially. Because uh, we want this to be universal. I mean, you, we want you to be able to play the game alone or with a friend, or you, or if you want to be the game master and play the, that adventure for uh, with some other people, with your with a regular group or whatever, you can do it. I mean, you can. Your, the game should adapt to to how you want to play it. Mm -hmm. And with with that in mind, 
even though you're leaning towards um, a harder end of SF with a, with the game, um, would it be fair of me to say that in the default setting there is some degree of FTL travel? Mm, well, there. I mean, there's definitely some kind of FTL travel because the that's how the alien spacecraft spacecraft uh, travels around the the whole galaxy. So yes. The race is just you don't have any <laughs> kind of control over it. I mean, you 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 just hop into the onto the spaceship and it travels for weeks using yes, definitely faster than light technology. Mm -hmm. But since there's no real control or no, you can't say okay, I'm going to explore this, this specific planet. No, you're you're literally a, a, just a passenger at least in this first uh, chapter of the game as I'm calling it <laughs> things will evolve with with future releases but right now yeah there's the level of the technological level of humanity is what you would expect the only thing that is a bit different is that the EM drive has been developed mm -hmm. so that means you can travel to the outer asteroid belt in in about 30 days instead of the months that it will take right now with a level with our current level of technology and that's the most sci-fi thing you will encounter in the game aside i mean from a human level human technological level perspective otherwise yeah the rest of course the aliens are totally sci-fi mm -hmm. and <clears throat> with the, and i'm guessing with Within the multitude of charts, one of the one of the charts that you have in mind is going to is going to cover um, the kind of things that you would discover with it within within alien ship within alien ships or ru or ruins. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's the whole that's the whole game. You arrive to um, a multitude of different possible alien sites. And I mean, it can be. A, I don't know. There's a. It's, the initial table is a D twenty table, so I don't know. I, uh, off the top of my head, you have uh, prison, prisons, um, entertainment areas, uh, gardens. I don't know what are residential areas. I mean, it's whatever you can think of. It's you. You'll have it on that table. So yes, of course you. You everything. Once you arrive there, everything is randomly generated. You have. A lot of different things that can happen when you're on, on a site. You can the typical encounter encounters with creatures that are not happy to see you. You have the old gardens of the place, which are mechanical or robotic cons constructs, which are usually found in all those alien places. Uh, defending them, then you have automatic uh, security measures. You have I don't know. <laughs> Even a couple of outlandish, strange things that are strongly influenced by films like uh, *Event Horizon* or or *Pandorum*. That kind of a bit more weird stuff. Well, that kind of stuff can happen too. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's there's a lot of things that can happen, and you you should be constantly surprised by the different combinations of of possibilities. Now, as I under as I understand it, you're shooting for around f for around four hundred pages. <clears throat> yeah, well, I think it's going. Well, I'm I'm pretty sure it's going to be more than that because the the, the book is done. I mean, it's everything is written except the couple of new stretch goals we have to write now. I'm I'm already working on on my side of things. Mm -hmm. I don't know how how many pages it's going to add, but I'm. I'm thinking at least another 20, 30 pages, something like that. But it all depends on what uh, Phil, our, our design guy, it all depends on what he, he does with the with the layout. Mm. So the pure text is over 200 pages right now, just text. Mm -hmm. So once you add all the art, and the different design elements, properly laid out tables, I don't know, all the visually appealing stuff, that 
that's going to bump up the book to closer to 500 pages, I think. Mm-hmm. So yes, it's a, it's a big, big book. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I like big books and I cannot lie. <laughs> yeah, so do I. <laughs> Especially when it's it's mostly referential though. So I mean, there's not you don't have to read the 500 pages to play. You just read the rules. Uh, the I mean the character creation chapter, the rules, and then how to actually play the game. So it's just three chapters that you must read. That's it. Three chapters. The rest is all randomly stuff, unrandomly generated stuff. I mean all tables, tables, tables that you uh, check when you while you're playing. So yeah, it's mostly referential stuff. Mm-hmm. And. With with that in mind, what would you be shooting for as far as a release window? Not a release date, but a ge- but a general ballpark. Um, I'm hoping we'll have it before. I mean, in, on the Kickstarter we said October to cover our backs, but I I think we should be done before that, unless there are unexpected delays, which always always are, but. As I mentioned, the book is written, except the couple of stretch goals that we need to add. Mm-hmm. I'm still ironing out a few th- things because the playtesting is still on- ongoing. So, but yeah, after the campaign is done, we'll hand, a- hand the all the ma- the manuscript to the editor. We will need, I would say, at least a couple of months to finish this because as <laughs> as as I mentioned before, it's a monster book. It's going to be over seventy thousand words. So yeah, that's, that's a lot of editing that he needs to do. And um, and then after the editing is done, then it's layout time, which should also take at least a month, if not more. And then it's another couple of months for the printing. So yeah, I don't know if everything goes absolutely perfect. We should be done by August, something like that, August September. But I don't know. I, anything between August and October, we we should we should land. Our the release date should land between those three months. Um, yeah, between those three months, because otherwise, I don't. I, I something happened. <laughs> something out of control happened. Which yeah, it can always happen, but. I wanted to make sure that everything was as finished as possible before starting the Kickstarter. So, so yeah, the, at least the, the PDF should be out definitely before summer or early summer. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I, I think we're we're doing well. We should be we should be in time before October. Everything should be fine. Yeah. All right, and I I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how it develops. But with all of that in mind, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come on to my show and enjoy the madness that happens here, that happens around here. I oh, know it's it's been a real pleasure and it's been fun. It's been great to have a chance to explain a little bit about the, the game and and thanks so much for for this opportunity. Mm-hmm. And. <clears throat> Anytime you see fit to return to the temple, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. (laughs) That's great. (laughs) Thanks. And, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then... On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!